everything I try to do, it's, it's built around this idea of, of you don't have to live your life the way others expect. You know, other people throughout your life, throughout your career, throughout your relationships, you know, everything. Other people have all sorts of ideas and preferences and assumptions, you know, for you. And you don't have to accommodate those, you know. And in fact, your life is probably going to be better if you don't, or at least if you don't accommodate them blindly. If you really take some time to figure out for yourself, you know, what is it that I, I want to get out of life and, and how, you know, eventually, how can I uniquely contribute? As applied to like gonzo capitalism, you know, personal finance. Okay. You know, there are a lot of books about personal finance, um, a lot of influencers, a lot of people talking about different things. I believe that most of that content has not really been updated in decades. And most people are kind of saying mostly the same things. And so, that, you know, that advice is not necessarily bad advice, mm -hmm. but I think it's kind of average advice. So one of the things I say in the book is like, if you want average results, follow an average system. You know, the systems of the world are, are made for average people just because of scale and how things work, right? You need yeah. something that a lot of people can go through like a really wide funnel. But if you want to be exceptional, you know, whether it is in the business you're running or your own personal finances or any other part of life, you can't really follow an average system. Like you have to be able to do something different somehow. My dear friend, Chris, welcome back to the show. It's great to have you. Thanks so much, man. Great to be here. Of course. It has been a hot minute. You've it been has. you've been doing what you do, going to one of those 193 countries all over again. What what have you been up to? It's it's great uh, to catch up. It is great. Yeah, I mean, I feel like uh, like a lot of people. I was in a vortex, you know, for a couple of years. Um, we talked last with the Money Tree when that book was coming out, mm -hmm. and I was all excited to go out and tour, and then I wasn't able to do that tour. Uh, but eventually, <sighs> I started working on this new project, and I don't know, just doing stuff, following you. <laughs> where was the last place on the planet that you were outside of where you are today? I was in Croatia and Austria for about a week, uh, I guess a few weeks ago, and then doing some domestic trips, uh, but nothing too exciting. So I'm getting ready to go out on the road for, for this. Yeah. But Austria and Croatia are mm. far apart, and I do not have any connective <laughs> tissue between those two things. So it's just like, I'm going to go to Vienna and then I'm going to go to the Pula Peninsula. I mean, what did, what did you, how, uh, <laughs> yeah, I was, well, I was supposed to go to Croatia for a week okay. and, um, I went there and I just wasn't feeling it. It wasn't Croatia's fault. Um, but I was part of this like week long trip, uh, like with a bunch of people and I, I, I enjoyed it for like two days and uh -huh. then I thought, what should I do in this situation? And I was like, I should leave, you know? <laughs> and so I, I booked a trip to Vienna and I went and I had a much better experience in Austria. <laughs> and I was like, this is a great, you know, lesson, probably not for anybody else, but at least for me about sunk costs and about you should do what makes you happy. And uh, it made me happy to go and, and be by myself and run a lot in Vienna and eat apple strudel and, <laughs> you know, just be thankful that I chose to get myself out of a situation that I was not thrilled about. Yeah. It, there is a lesson in there about life for sure. Um, <laughs> Speaking of lessons, I've learned a lot of lessons from you over the year. I was looking at my notes and thinking this morning in preparation for our conversation, uh, I think really fondly of the World Domination Summit, uh, which is an, an amazing event that you produced for years and years. Um, and I think it's one of the best conferences that the world has ever seen. And of course, the World okay. Domination is a tongue-in-cheek title, um, but so many interesting, collaborative, smart, talented, creative people uh, you know, attended those and spoke on that stage that you curated so uh, beautifully. And it was interesting to me as I was thinking about our history together with, you know, we've made a lot of these recordings and there's a lot of uh, community overlap between your world and mine. And it struck me that we have this great past together and the, obviously the pandemic was weird for everybody. And you have emerged with what is, to me, seemingly your most evocative work. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering, before we get into that actual work, a new book, to be clear, um, and the title of that book is Gonzo Capitalism, but like, what happened <laughs> between, <laughs> what happened in that little, that little window sure. that, that, I mean, again, not that Gonzo Capitalism does not 
share this overlap with our audience because we are capitalists mm-hmm. and we are creators and we need sure. to take care of ourselves and one another. And, you know, mm-hmm. money is real and important. And so are our jobs and careers. But it seems like this is very evocative for for Chris G. So what what went down in that little yeah. period where we didn't Great. overlap a bunch? Great question. Yeah. Um, what went down? Well, uh, this was this was probably the hardest book to write. I've done eight books so far. It took me the longest to write. In fact, I wrote this book probably three different times. Um, you know, which I don't recommend. I think it's better to like write a book once. Um, I don't mean three different drafts. I mean it was probably like six or seven drafts. Uh, it just because things were changing a lot. I think things were changing a lot in the world of money and the understanding of like the pandemic economy and the post pandemic economy. Uh, a lot of shifts with how people were thinking about work in terms of the great resignation, quiet quitting, all these different trends and such, Um, you know, a bit of a backlash against hustle culture, which I think is always interesting because like you and I, maybe we kind of came out of hustle. We were like, we want to hustle, right? Right. We have a podcast called Side Hustle School, Um, you know, but definitely a lot of people feeling like, hey, what is life really about, you know? Um, And also like, how much do I want to hustle for? somebody else's company versus versus hustling, you know, for myself and what, what, you know, matters to me. So that's kind of like the bigger picture than also just myself. I mean, I had some mental health issues and was just kind of sad and anxious, you know, for a while, mm-hmm. like yeah. a lot of people have been at different times. And I, I really wanted to come out of this period with, you know, a work that I was proud of that could hopefully make a difference in people's lives uh, and that people could, could kind of get attached to and say, this is really cool. I can do something with this. I feel like, you know, I understand Gonzo Cap, like there's, I, I know that there's something to all these different stories of the creator economy, uh, but I feel like maybe I've been outside it for a while. I feel like a lot of mm. people feel excluded. And mm. so, you know, what can we do to help people get kind of how people get back into that or get into it in the first, first place? Like originally I was going to call the book, uh, the new rules of money. So it is kind of like a subtext, you know, like that's yeah. what the book is about. Um, and I think Gonzo Capitalism is probably a better title just because it's like interesting and memorable. Also, people don't like rules, you know, but ultimately <laughs> it's about um, what can you do today, you know, to, to get ahead in this new world order. You know, a lot of people are upset about a lot of things. A lot of people have kind of reorganized things and, and that's fine. But what can you do, practically speaking, you know, to get ahead for yourself so that you can do more of what's important to you? Yeah, so that's that's basically the, the the backstory of it. But it took a long time to write. Well, I'm glad you took a long time to write it because it's profound, and mm-hmm. the fact that yep. it is, um, to me, it's a very interesting take on money. And I think we should take some of our time today to explore a couple different um, the lenses that you approach money, personal finance, uh, mm-hmm. what we can do, as you said, the practic the practical application. I'm curious, I hadn't heard you or, I mean, I, I took this contextually out of the work, but there's a feeling that the creator economy was once, I would say, ours, creators, mm. entrepreneurs, people who were, uh, to quote you know, your podcast title, side hustling and doing mm-hmm. all those you know, interesting ways of making a living in a non-traditional way, going all the way back to your first work, The Art of Nonconformity. But uh, it's it's interesting to hear that there was a period where you felt like an outsider on arguably the economy that you helped create. How's that? Yeah, um, I guess I was just kind of looking around and feeling a little bit disconnected from it. And also feeling like maybe the scale of things has changed a bit too. Mm -hmm. So part of what I wanted wanted to understand is what is new, you know, Mm -hmm. about this time. And I use this phrase, this concept, peak marketplace. It's one of the concepts of the book. It's like, I, I really do believe we're living in this time of peak marketplace. And, you know, I've been like selling stuff online, doing things online for like 25 years, you know, when, when eBay was founded, you know, 1999 or 2000, you know, I started selling coffee and video games and other stuff. So I felt back then I was like, oh man, this is crazy. It's a whole new world. And like people can buy and sell stuff. And that was true, but I feel like it's so much more now. And now like there is a market for everything. There's a platform for everything. At the same time, there's also a lot of overwhelm with that. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot of overwhelm. And and as I said, some backlash that comes with that too. So how does one navigate that essentially? And I I was like, what are the qualities of peak marketplace? And came up with a few and like one, it's, you know, it's really faster than ever. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, two, it's uh, more decentralized than ever. 
Yep. You know, it used to be, you know, even though you could sell things online, you still had to go through various gatekeepers. You know, you still had to be approved to get a merchant account, you know, which was a, a difficult process, you know, back in the day. Um, so now things are much more decentralized. And then also, I think maybe just kind of there's this element of quirkiness or like strange or maybe weirder than ever, you know, in some of the stories that I, I like researched and looked at in the book. Um, I'm always surprised at some of the things that people can do, you know, to make money. I have a profile of this guy uh, in Australia named Jakey Bohm, who is a sleep fluencer. Have you heard this phrase before? Sleep fluencer? <laughs> Only you from know. you. Right. <laughs> he, uh, he gets paid. He spends eight hours a day um, or at night, you know, but it's like opposite our time right in Australia. And um, he spends eight hours a night in this room, which is all rigged up with really cool lighting and sound and such. Um, uh, on, he streams this on TikTok and people are paying to keep him awake. Basically, like you can pay using TikTok's virtual currency to play different sounds or have various lights and things go off. And um, so he does this crazy thing. It sounds totally ridiculous and absurd. And he's making $50,000 a month doing it. Um, and I think that's interesting because people always have like complaints about this. You're like, well, he's like staying up all throughout the night. This is so terrible for his sleep. And you're like, well, you know, first of all, he's really young. And this is just a fun thing. It's probably not going to continue forever. Um, it's going to be a great story. And then also, you know, he's making $50,000 a month. And then, so that's, you know, I'd probably like wake up a few times in the middle of the night <laughs> for that. Uh, and then like third, you know, he could just like sleep during the day, right? <laughs> you know, he could actually sleep <laughs> during the day and he's just doing his eight hours of live streaming. So this is just one example, right? Of yeah. like how things are, are kind of quirky and, and strange, but yet really, really interesting. And I think a lot of that came about like during the pandemic. And the yeah. pandemic economy. Well, the term peak mm. implies like peak marketplace, peak, the peak part is it seems like it's a double edged sword. Mm -hmm. And is that on purpose? Is it peak in like this is the maximum and it can't get any faster or any crazier <laughs> or any, you know, is this a prediction? Is this like, you know, when I'm right. looking at that phrase, mm. I feel like, and also knowing you for, whatever more than a decade or maybe even 15 years at this right. point there's there seems like there's an edge to that phrase hmm. for me so i'm wondering you know if you can if you can excavate a little further for us yeah that's really interesting uh i don't know if it's a prediction you know i'm not really a futurist i'm kind of like how are things now you know and what can we do like right now um as opposed to like here's how things might be you know and i, I feel like i feel like there is a lot of uncertainty I think uncertainty is a value in which we have to become comfortable uh, in just because there is a lot that's unknown, you know? Mm -hmm. So I have a chapter on AI in the book, but I had to be really careful in writing that chapter because of how publishing is delayed. And I even knew like a year ago, I, I, I have to try to write something that's going to hold up, you know, a year from now and, and potentially beyond that. Um, but I do think obviously AI and so many other, other things are, are changing by the, you know, the week, by the day and such. Uh, yeah. So we don't know necessarily. What's mm -hmm. going to happen? And I think it's also okay to like not make a long-term strategic plan all the time, you know, especially for younger people, like they don't necessarily have to know, you don't, you don't have to know your life purpose when you're 20 years old. Uh, right. You don't have to know what your business is going to look like, you know, for the next five or 10 years. What you need to figure out is, you know, what can I do right now, uh, both to advance my interests and hopefully to create something that, you know, has some value, uh, you know, to the world. All right. So. What we've just trotted out in the last, let me look here, a uh, couple, 12 minutes, we've got a wide ranging landscape of stuff we can talk about. To me, it's really important to start at the foundation of the relationship between the things that people think you should do mm. and what you should do. Mm hmm so again, this, this sort of is a nod back to some of your earlier work, the art of nonconformity, like within that title is we're not going to conform and this new work, very mm -hmm. prescient. Mm -hmm. So what if, if like you were to posit a, a state of the state, you, you're talking about being yeah. practical and what it is right now, like mm -hmm. what is this in terms of the opportunities to, you know, march to your own drum? Or mm -hmm. how ought we think about the, what the world has historically wanted for us and what we want for ourselves now? Yeah, great question. Uh, and maybe I'll answer by sharing how some of my views have changed or been yeah. updated. Sure. Uh, so the you know the central 
thesis of like my life, my work, everything I try to do, it's, it's built around this idea of, of you don't have to live your life the way others expect. You know, other people throughout your life, throughout your career, throughout your relationships, you know, everything, other people have all sorts of ideas and preferences and assumptions, you know, for you, and you don't have to accommodate those, you know, and in fact, your life is probably going to be better if you don't, or at least if you don't accommodate them blindly, if you really take some time to figure out for yourself, you know, what is it that I, I want to get out of life and, and how, you know, eventually, how can I uniquely contribute uh, in mm -hmm. some way? But if you start with that, like you don't have to live your life the way others expect, um, there is another way, like there are alternatives, you know, for whatever path, you know, that others uh, have kind of, you know, outlined for you, that's fine. That may be the right path, but there are, there are alternatives as well. Um, so I take that like as a starting point and as applied to like gonzo capitalism, you know, personal finance. Okay. You know, there are a lot of books about personal finance, um, a lot of influencers, a lot of people talking about different things. I believe that most of that content has not really been updated in decades. And most people are kind of saying mostly the same things. And so, that, you know, that advice is not necessarily bad advice, mm -hmm. but I think it's kind of average advice. So one of the things I say in the book is like, if you want average results, follow an average system. You know, the systems of the world are, are made for average people just because of scale and how things work, right? You need yeah. something that a lot of people can go through like a really wide funnel. But if you want to be exceptional, you know, whether it is in the business you're running or your own personal finances or any other part of life, you can't really follow an average system. Like you have to be able to do something different somehow. So um, like there's a chapter about personal finance specifically, and I'm writing about frugality. I used to be really frugal and stopped worrying about that to some degree. Uh, I realized that even like small amounts of money, just being able to spend small amounts of money would make me happier, you know, in some ways. Um, I used to be very opposed to debt and I still don't love debt, but I think before it was like debt is an evil thing. It's terrible. Nobody should ever have any debt. And I think one of the things that we've seen through like the pandemic economy, there was a lot of stimulus package packages, um, a lot of governments printing money, corporations borrowing lots of money. Like I learned that, that Apple, you know, has hundreds of billions of dollars in cash, but they're still borrowing like a hundred billion dollars as well. And they're like, why don't they just pay it back? Like, actually, maybe it's better for them to have the debt. And so I'm just kind of thinking differently about debt. Um, there's this concept of, you know, a, a, like a bumper sticker, pithy Instagram message about buying experiences. You know, you should always like buy experiences, not stuff. And I mean, experiences are great, but sometimes it's okay to, you know, like I say, it's okay to buy a couch. Like if a couch makes you happy, you shouldn't feel <laughs> I see bad one. about that. I have, <laughs> yeah, I, I bought that couch, right? Um, so, I mean, these are just a couple of examples of like updated views of like, you start with this principle of like, people expect something from you and there's another way to do it. You know, what are those ways? What are those alternatives? How can somebody out there apply these lessons, you know, today? When I hear you talk about, you know, the av average systems, you know, the, the concept of a system is largely around built around averages, right? Mm -hmm. A system is a repeatable thing and right. things that are anomalies or outliers, they are difficult to repeat. So almost mm -hmm. tautologically true. It's like, it, yes. it, it, it sort of has to be an average. And one of the things that strikes me about averages is it's, you know, there's a data set mm -hmm. in an average and you add all those things up and divide by the number of inputs that in that set. And that's how you get an average number. But mm -hmm. Thinking if you map that onto your, you know, vision of nonconformity and, you know, again, going back to what you opened with in the front page of your site is you don't have to live a life the way others expect that you are a data set of one, hmm. right? So the concept of an average is sort of out the window if you have this sort of authentic relationship to yourself. And mm -hmm. you just gave us a number of personal finance examples. Mm -hmm. You did mention AI, mm -hmm. but let's look at some other areas of oh. money, other areas of money that are not just the personal finance stuff. Like for right. example, sure. let's go back to these. I think you, you, this, you mentioned sleep influencer as an example. <laughs> and, and I think so many people, one of the ways that I thought you were going to take our conversation when I first said like, well, you know, I, I, there's a little edge to your thing here. What's, mm. you know, when you said that you might not see yourself in this economy or 
it seems like even the idea of living an unexpected, non-conforming life as a as a solopreneur mm-hmm. now has a whole bunch of averages because it's happened for long enough. Now we're talking right. about tw- twenty years. Sure, that there's the, there. Okay, you have you know a mailing list, and you you, you do right. like these the, you like d- these ten functions are mm-hmm. now normal for that world. Mm-hmm. So as you were researching, I mean, I've got a handful of the examples that you provide in the book here in front of me that are completely outlandish and beyond the scope of the things that you think solopreneurs or entrepreneurs, small business owners would be doing right now. Mm-hmm. So I'm wondering if by example, you can, you can give us a yeah. couple of those and sure. also make a few other statements about the ways that you know the economy, uh, which you say hates us, mm-hmm. has, you know, ha- where, where there are beautiful blind spots that we should we should become aware of you know on, on just to go to that last point first uh the economy that hates us you know i i didn't come up with that subtitle somebody else did and at first i was like how do i feel about that and i just i started sending it around to a few people i'm like what do you think about this and it was very resonant a lot of people were like this is this is how people feel now like people f- do feel that there is a certain unfairness you know out there that that some things are inaccessible to them or they are excluded as I said, um, and I want, you know, everything I do to be inclusive, right? So it's like, how can we help people succeed or help people thrive um, in that situation where they're either, you know, objectively or just their perception is that, you know, they are excluded. So if we go then to, um, you know, that system of average, and you mentioned how like society and corporations, they build systems because that's how, you know, large societies and corporations exist, you know, and, and thrive. That's true. And so the question is like, who are we, who are we speaking to? And for the person who, you know, wants to be in that, be in that system, then that's great. You do that. But I know like from all of your work and everything that you've done, you speak mostly to individuals, Mm -hmm. right? Individuals, creatives, you know, a creative by nature thinks differently. A creative is like, what can we do? That's a little bit different and interesting and, and fun. And that's always been, you know, like you said, some crossover, that's always been the person that I want to speak to. Uh, the person who maybe does feel a little bit lonely or alone, or just feels like there's something I want that's different than what everybody else wants. So, you know, one, is that okay? How can I feel affirmed? How can I feel like, you know, it's acceptable, um, even beneficial for me to, to pursue that? And then two, once I, you know, have that, how do I do it? Right. How do I actually do it? Um, and in terms of uh, other examples, um, I really like the story of uh, Miss Excel. Have you heard of Miss Excel? She's big on TikTok and other streaming platforms. Um, this is so the Ms. only person you've said so far that I've, he- I've actually heard of. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, Miss Excel is, you know, she is, she is selling Microsoft Excel, you know, spreadsheet courses and tutorials and such. Uh, she's built a massive following. I think it's it well over a million people at this point across different platforms. And her, all of her content consists of like dance videos and spreadsheet tips. And she has monetized this to hundreds of thousands of dollars a month, um, which is really crazy. So that's where the scale comes in because it's funny in the hundred dollar startup, I wrote this other book like more than 10 years ago, I actually profiled this guy in India who was like the original Microsoft office influencer. And he had created this blog of spreadsheet tips and he was making like a hundred thousand dollars a year. And at the time I was like, that's incredible. That's just, yeah. that's, you know, truly, you know, fantastic. Uh, but now, because of the scale of, of technologies and platforms, Miss Excel, you know, has kind of taken the crown of the, the Microsoft Office, you know, influencer category. And even though it's interesting and different and creative with the twists and all that, what she is doing, actually, business-wise, isn't that strange. You know, business-wise, she is providing a solution to a problem. You know, there's lots of office workers that spend hours a day using spreadsheets or databases, or other tools. And, you know, if she can help people save like a lot of time, work more efficiently, you know, that has, has tremendous value. So it's interesting. What I try to do, um, you know, throughout the book is present stories and tell the case studies, but then also deconstruct it a little bit and say, okay, you know, what could you do that's kind of like this? I mean, maybe she's got that covered already, but there's probably something else. And it usually connects to a pretty simple business lesson that's actually not profound, you know, or, or not contemporary at all. It's just about supply and demand or, you know, again, a pro, you know, solution to a problem or meeting a need. 
And so, you know, that's something that's been around forever. It's just how do we adapt that in the modern economy and not just now, but then as you were saying before, like how do we, you know, use it to prepare for what's, what's to come. Yeah. I want to talk about the scale thing now, Mm -hmm. because you, you talked about, you know, a couple of the, the, the nature of, so the twist for Miss Excel relative to the original Microsoft influencer that you've, that you ferreted out from, uh, Uh from India. Um, so it was a hundred thousand dollars a year versus hundreds of thousands per mm-hmm. month. Mm-hmm. So that's, you know, I think almost by definition, order of magnitude more. Mm-hmm. And I, I feel like that is a, when our parents and people who care deeply about us, our spouses, sometimes even, you know, our loved ones, career counselors, friends, they see these crazy things that we do as creators, as entrepreneurs, mm. and they don't understand it. And there is a belief that the risk is on us to do these strange, unique, differentiated things. But I would argue that the risk is actually not doing those things. Mm. So that's point one that I'd like yep. to get you to respond sure. to. And then, and then before we do, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to plant the second one because I think they go part and parcel. So it's the risk of your time to not do the thing that you're passionate about that's interesting. And then two, what, like, what do you tell people who don't really have a sense of the scale of what's possible? What do you tell those people on either side of this aisle, either the mm, person who's the crazy okay. one or the okay. spouse who thinks that their yeah. partner is crazy? Uh, mm-hmm. Like, talk to me about those mm-hmm. two things because I'm fascinated by that. You know, a great question to, to ask in these situations for either the person or the spouse, um, and this will tie into the first part of the question as well, is like, what could go wrong? You know, what could go wrong with this? Thing. And, you know, historically, when we've talked about starting businesses, like a lot of things can go wrong. You know, you're going to have to like mortgage your house or take out your savings account. Or even if you're not spending money, there's a great deal of time you know, that, you know, is invested before you see if there's any potential return or not. Whereas in the projects that I, I really think are, you know, sometimes the most fascinating, you know, there's a lot of like learning, like life learning that takes place on the front end. You know, Miss Excel had to actually like, you know, become an expert at Microsoft Excel. Um, but the point is she had that and it was like, how can I use that skill that I already have? How can I monetize that? And like, it's very low risk, you know, like if it doesn't work, it doesn't work, right? If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. So I'll try something else. I I haven't, uh, you know, destroyed my savings account or made some kind of terrible mistake. Um, in fact, it's, so I talk a lot about this idea of, of an asymmetrical risk, which Mm. is, you know, where the, the potential upside is, you know, really great, unlimited even, and where and the downside, if it doesn't work, is not that bad. And so I think something that's really important for everyone, uh, whether it is in business, personal finance, or just life in general, is to always kind of ask, where is that lopsided risk? You know, it doesn't necessarily mean that every risk is going to pay off. But if you just imagine like throughout your life, you know, throughout different career decisions you make, if you can identify where the, the return is so much greater than the downside and you just keep taking those, then, you know, when that pays off, that's, then that's fantastic. You know, then you end up with, with one of these things, but you, you'll never know until you try. Like almost everything with uh, every business idea that I feature in this book and other books, it's very difficult to validate it in advance. You know, there are a lot of other business books and other authors who are very good at, at validation and market testing, and they've got all these systems. And I'm not trying to knock it. Like I respect, I respect that process, but it doesn't really work for a lot of these kinds of ideas. The only way to, to figure out if it's going to work because nobody's done it before, nobody's done it in this way, uh, is to try. And if you can limit the risk, you know, and limit the downside, then why wouldn't you? As you said, you know, as you said, the greater the greater risk is not to try. The greater risk is to remain stuck. It is to be in a place where you're like, I had this idea, and I thought it could be a really great idea. I wasn't sure, but now I'll never know right? Because I didn't try, you know, the greater risk is just to remain beholden to the systems of the world that other people control, as opposed to creating something for yourself one way or another. Yeah. And those systems, I think it's interesting. Those systems are all it's, I think it's almost true. 
I, I'm, I don't know if I'm prepared to go on record, but <laughs> like there is largely in these systems, in very few systems, there are, are, is there someone who has it out for you? Mm-hmm. However, systems, again, almost by definition, and if you go back to our, our references to average, sort of they almost by definition like uh, limit your upside, limit your mm-hmm. um, the 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 amount of influence or control or or ownership that you can have. So uh, I, I do think there's a it's a fascinating time when you think about systems and how to play within them when you need to and how to play outside of them, which is to me what you know as I'm looking at this work, it is it's so classic, Chris. It is. Mm. It's so. so well done. Um, the, I need to scrape a little bit further on this idea of the things that the scale bit, because mm-hmm. most folks, I believe, have misunderstood. And to be fair, you and I were creators prior to this term actually being sure. um, used to describe right. the work that we did. And influencer wasn't a thing either. Mm-hmm. Well, I don't even know what what we called ourselves um, or what the world called us, but maybe just, I don't know, entrepreneurs, <laughs> creators. Sure. Uh, we, uh, well, I just that's, use the word that is, <laughs> <that's> <laughs> <laughs> you, saw my, you saw the trap that I fell in there. But I remember my parents saying, specifically my dad in this case, I'll throw him under the bus, <laughs> was like, okay, cool. Like, well, you should give your pictures away because I don't know who's going to buy that picture. I mean, I watched you take that picture <laughs> and I know there wasn't a lot, a lot that went into it. So I sure. really have a hard time seeing how someone's going to pay you. Maybe you should give it away, give your, get your name out there. And, mm-hmm. and at the time I was sort of, you know, nonsense. And mm-hmm. here we are probably, mm-hmm. you know, tens of millions of dollars later in that line of work, not to mention right. the creative live work. Mm-hmm. And, I think if you ask my dad, he would say, well, it was so obvious that that was going to mm. work. Mm. Okay. So, so I'm trying to reconcile. That was, you know, let's argue that we started sort of doing this stuff 10 plus 15 years ago. Mm-hmm. You, you said 20 when we started selling things on, yeah. you started selling things on eBay. And I would, I certainly had my photography business at that time. But help orient us to this new world. Because you're saying hundreds of thousands of dollars per month as is one example that you use in the book. Mm-hmm. And there are others that are that, you know, that big and or bigger. So what is the ups, what is the limit? Is, is, is it truly limitless? I mean, what's the cap as people yeah. are starting to think about it, inventing or reinventing themselves? Right. I mean, I guess it's, uh, I'm sure there is a cap somewhere, you know, for, for these things. But to me, it's kind of like, that's a conceptual exercise. Like, I don't quite know like how many millions of dollars Miss Excel has made or how much she can make in her life, but it's kind of a, a good problem to have, you know, if like one day it's like, oh, she, she only made, you know, X million dollars, you know, dancing on TikTok and selling these courses or for the other guy we talked about, the guy who gets paid to stay up, you know, at night. Well, it only worked for X number of months, you know, does it matter? Uh, we're talking about developing skills. Like you're going to develop a skill. Um, a set of skills, really, and a, and a range of experiences that you can apply in lots of different ways. So, you know, when you when your dad, you know, gave you that advice, you know, your dad was really smart. He knew about a lot of things, but maybe he didn't know, uh, you know, about about that thing, right? Um, or maybe he maybe it was right at one time and it wasn't right then. And and you know, things change over time. Things are changing even now. I mean, in the past few years, things have changed so much with social media and how people are are creating content and courses. Um, I have a whole chapter about like online education and people who've been really smart, you know, creating some million dollar businesses, you know, of just like one person or two people, um, things will always change, but if you develop the skills and you get that range of experiences, then you can apply them in different ways. I think that's the key rather than trying to find, here's the one thing I'm going to do for the rest of my life. Right. I mean, one, that's a lot of pressure Two, you're probably going to get it wrong. There might be something better that comes along you know, by, by pursuing other things along the way. So I guess I just encourage people like get experience, Mm. you know, get experience. Don't worry about having the answers to everything. Don't worry about every, everything you try working, um, because one thing is going to lead to, to another. 
and who knows what the, the the environment will look like in in you know three years or five years from now. But I guarantee, and I, and I hope you would agree with this. Like what we do now is going to help us. Then just like when we were starting with the blog or the photography business, you know, you and I are still like using those lessons and drawing on relationships that we built during that time and um, you know, different things that we went through with what we're doing now. Yeah, I've got this phrase: no effort is ever wasted. And mm. you don't know how this effort is going to serve you at some point in the future, but this mm -hmm. belief that that was a dead end or that mm. this relationship didn't work or that business idea failed, like all of those things are things in this beautiful backpack of life that we carry mm. forward with us. I that love we, that. We don't, you know, we never know when we're going to pull out the Swiss army knife of that failed relationship or that broken yeah. business. That's really good. I think that's very important. I hope people catch that because I feel that there is a lot of pressure on us, on everyone. Um, and I feel like a lot of people kind of say the opposite message of what you just said. And, and there's this culture of hyper efficiency and hyper optimization that basically suggests that a lot of effort is wasted, you know, that so much effort is wasting and uh, wasted and, and you are spending your time doing the wrong thing. And that's very anxiety provoking, you know, yeah. it's very <laughs> intimidating. It's, um, I mean, I have, I have struggled with that, you know, in recent years, just like, wow, there's so much that I could be doing. How do I know what's best? And I, I have to make the perfect choice. And, and really, I, I'm not going to make the perfect choice. So I should not worry about that so much. There are a lot of choices that I could make. You know, for every person who's listening or watching, there are a lot of choices that you could make right now. And many of those would be perfectly fine. You know, but, it, but if you live in that space of I must have the, the magic answer, I must live this hyper optimized, you know, uber efficient life, um, then I think you're, you're, um, I don't want to say you're, you're bound to struggle, but most likely it's, it's going to be difficult for you at some point. And I, mm -hmm. I would love for, you know, that person to be able to avoid that. What you mentioned skills. These are really skills as you're talking about Miss Excel or Mr. Mm -hmm. Beast or yeah. like, we've got all these, uh, you know, what's mm -hmm. Mr. Beast's, you know, revenue line. That's just bananas. Right. Like when they are, and by extension, our listeners and watchers now mm -hmm. doing, pursuing the things that light them up or pursuing these ideas that they have or an extension of their existing business to try and grow and change and evolve. What are, in your mind, having studied so many case studies and having built so many businesses yourself, what are these key skills mm -hmm. that we're developing? Let's put a name to them so that people who are yeah. listening and watching can, can, sort of look at themselves in the mirror with this list next to them and say, am I, am I doing these things that Chris thinks are, are critical skills or am I developing them? Yeah, very smart. Uh, I think it's good to put them in two broad categories. Uh, you know, one category is like your technical skills, like your hard skills, we could say, and the other one is your soft skills. So I don't think that technical skills are irrelevant. In fact, I think they're really important. They're vital. Uh, so, I mean, it is good to study coding or study photography or videography or learn like, there's a lot of advanced tools apps and software um, i think it's i think it's worthwhile you know to spend a, a good portion of your time you know especially when you're younger and you have some time to invest in education or you have more time let's say uh, i think it's i think it's important to make a list of like here are some technical skills that might be helpful you know to to me uh, because they will be but uh ultimately i think your technical skills are best served you know when they are deployed in a way that uh, is creating community of some kind. And community can be a lot of different things. Community is, you know, all those people watching Mr. Beast. You know, why do we watch Mr. Beast? Because he's coming up with all these zany projects and it's entertaining and it's, it's life affirming in a weird way, you know? Um, and it, it would be easy to say like, what skill does he have? You know, what is he, he's just like this, you know, 23 year old guy who gives away millions of dollars, which is weird. Uh, how does he have millions of dollars in the first place? But there is there is community to it. There is so there's like this empathy that um, underlies like so many of these projects, and they don't stand up there and say like, "Hey, my project is you know to project empathy." But uh, ultimately, I think you know most most of the most successful creators uh, they have either spent a lot of time like really studying their soft skills. You know, they've read Vanessa Van Edwards' books and watched her videos. You know, another mutual friend of ours is yes. really big on that. Uh, or just naturally and organically, maybe and or uh, in addition to like the formal study, they have just learned to become a better person. And I think when you put these things together, 
it's maybe it's three things. So it's technical skills, it's these soft skills and really building community and focusing on empathy and then finding, okay, what is the, the outlet? You know, how do I take these things and then create creative live, you know, or the chase driver show or whatever the, uh, you know, whatever the particular project is, which again, it will probably be multiple projects over time. But I think that is, if there is a formula, that's the formula, like get good at something, uh, get really good at building community and support around it, making sure that you're actually contributing something that's truly helpful to someone, uh, which can be so many things. Uh, and then figuring out what's the twist, you know, on this, or or what's the packaging, the wrapper that I put on this that is a little bit different than what other people have done. It doesn't have to be the first thing, you know, the most unique thing that's ever been created, uh, but there's some kind of twist or something different about it. And that's when I think you start to get attention and people uh, begin to kind of rally around your cause. Mm. So well said. Thank you for that. And I don't want to put you on the spot here, but you had what I feel like is one of the best descriptors or um, lenses through which to understand if something is working. So you've mm. talked, for example, we'll just keep using Miss Excel. Like, yeah, and sure. there are there are people who are listening and watching that are doing something right now as an experiment. Mm -hmm. To their credit, they may have even labeled it as an experiment rather than "I'm all in on black" or whatever mm -hmm. that they don't know if mm -hmm. it's working yet and they don't know if they should stop that thing and do another right. thing. Should I stop being Miss Excel and should I go be Mr. Beast 2.0 mm -hmm. like, or, or right. better, better yet, you know, the, the only, the, the number one version of yourself, but the concept is the question is rather like, how do you know if something's working? Right. Right. Um, well, I guess if you're making a hundred thousand dollars a month, dancing on a streaming platform, you know, that's working. Keep doing that, right? Um, but most of us are not in that place. And so most of us are in a place of like, oh, this is a this is an interesting idea. You know, I'm excited about it. And I've been trying it for a little while. But as you said, I'm in this space of not really knowing. Uh, you know, I used to talk about this a long time ago, the, the test of like, do I keep going? Do I stop? And so I think you always ask yourself, like, first of all, you know, am I in it? Like, am I still a believer in this? Like, am I motivated to do it? Um, and then you ask yourself, like, is it working in terms of the metrics? Is it like, are, are people watching? You know, if I'm trying to sell something, is anyone buying at all? And so it's pretty simple, you know, from there, it's like, okay, if, if, if people are buying or people are watching and you're enjoying it, you don't even need to ask yourself this question at all, right? You just keep, keep doing it. And, um, if you're, if it's the opposite of it, if it doesn't seem to really be getting traction or engagement, and you're also kind of thinking, yeah, I was into it for a while, but maybe there's something else better, then that's really obvious. Also, you just this is the, this is your time to stop. Like, don't waste another day. You know, just just stop. At the beginning of this conversation, we were talking about I was on a trip recently to to Europe, and I went to Croatia, and I wasn't having the best time of my life. Uh, and even though I was supposed to be there for a week, I left three and a half days early just because I was like, I think I could, you know go and do something that I'll enjoy more. And I'm really glad I did that. Um, like I would have been unhappy to stay. So the thing where it gets hard is like when these values are in conflict, mm -hmm. you know, exactly. Uh, and what, the answer to is one or the other. And you're really motivated to, you know, about something, you still believe in it, but you're not getting the viewers. Like nobody is subscribing to your channel or, or nobody's buying the product that you've made. Then I think what you do is you have to change something. Like you have to just say, this is the reality. Right. Like I have to, I can't just, uh, you know, magically create customers or viewers or subscribers or whatever I'm trying to do. Something I'm doing is not working, but I still really want it to work. So what else can I, that's where you change one of the inputs or the, or the variables. Um, and then, you know, the fourth quadrant is like when it's still working, but your heart is no longer in it. And I think this is the, the, the creator, you know, to be true to the creator mindset. I think it's really important to stop that too, or at least build yourself an off ramp. Uh, because you don't want to just spend your days saying, what did I do today? Well, I traded time for money. Okay, well, that's fine. Like we need money to live, but what is the purpose of our life? You know, the purpose of our life, hopefully, uh, is to do meaningful things that are meaningful for us and for others. And if, if one part of that is missing, then ultimately we're going to be unsatisfied. So I think you have to, to work towards creating change in some way or another when mm -hmm. one of those things doesn't line up. Beautiful. That was from 
born for this, I think. That's right. Yeah. yeah You've asked right. me that about that a number of times. I always think yeah. about you when, when I, when I'm in situations of like, should I quit or should I keep going? I'm always like, Oh, I got to remember this conversation with Chase. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm fascinated by it because it's, it's come up so much in my own world. And I would say, you know, if, uh, after I get off a stage or if I look at my text community, these are mm. really, really durable questions that people mm. ask me. They're still asking, you know, and I'm mm. thinking that, you know, prior to me asking this on today's show, someone was thinking it. So right. Um, right. I had a, I had to throw it back out there. Now, you were going to title the book, The New Rules for Money, mm. and you chose to call it Gonzo Capitalism, How to Make Money in an Economy That Hates You, which is a phenomenal title, by the way. Congrats to you and the team for coming up with that. Let's, let's ditch the, the fancy title and think about it in terms of new rules for money. We talked mm -hmm. a little bit about you know, how to, that, that there is more opportunity now that it's riskier now than ever before to sort of do what was conventionally thought as safe. We mm -hmm. talked about how you know, you're kind of throwing rocks at personal finance in that it's hasn't really been updated mm -hmm. what else is in uh, you know in that um tapestry of of new rules of money that mm -hmm. we haven't really touched on that you yes. think is interesting so one of the one of the reasons why this book took a long time to write is i was doing a series of experiments for it and i'm the kind of person where i'm I'm not like an academic researcher in the sense where I'm just dispassionately looking at concepts or ideas. Uh, I like to just jump in and do stuff. And I'm compulsive. If I start reading about something that, that seems interesting, I'm like, I want to try it. And I want to get really into it. So um, I have a whole chapter about uh, play to earn gaming, uh, like playing, playing video games for real money, like all these different little blockchain video games that are out there now. And I spent a number of months uh, just kind of immersed in that world and like figuring out, okay, how does, how does this actually work? You can play games, you can get paid. You know, a lot of people, people do. Um, I have a chapter about prediction markets uh, where you can bet on anything, bet on political events, political elections, uh, world events, celebrity culture. Um, like I, I bet on Britney Spears conservatorship, um, whether that was going to end or not. Like there's these platforms you can go to and do this. And so I'm kind of looking at all these different like, systems again, um, or platforms or markets that didn't exist before and kind of providing some tips and tricks and like, okay, if you want to get into this, you're going to need to do some more reading and, and exploration, but you know, here's an overview. Here's how you can jump into this world right away. So, um, there's also some AI art stuff. Um, but yeah, the, you know, the video games about the prediction markets. Um, I, I did a whole chapter about people who are working multiple jobs, uh, like full time simultaneously. Uh, without the employers knowing about it. And so I, part of that is the ethical question of like, is that, is that okay? And I tend to approach that as just like, I want to understand it. I want to understand how a person does it and just like physically and practically, like what are the, what's the, the process for that? Um, and kind of let the reader just reader decide, you know, like, is that, is that something that I want to do? Or do I just find it interesting, you know, to see how somebody else has done it, uh, whether I want to do it or not. So yeah, throughout the book, it's like a whole series of experiments, lots of practical tips for each thing um, that hopefully will leave people not just feeling inspired, but also like equipped, you know, to go and try something for themselves. Excellent. Thank you for that. I'm now going to give you a line mm. and I would like you to respond. This is a line that you wrote as a part of the, the book and book packaging. I'd like you just to respond to it. And, and we'll see where it takes us. The traditional ways of earning a living are outdated, if not outright rigged. Mm -hmm. What do you mean? I mean that what worked at one time, you know, either no longer works or it only works for some people in some situations. And so if you keep trying the same thing, uh, if you keep trying to do what other people have suggested, uh, and it's not working, maybe it's not your fault. So maybe it's not your fault, uh, but then you have to ask, what, do, what, do I, what am I going to do about it? And so that's what the book is about. Mm. There's this, the, the concept of it being rigged sort of reeks, I think, appropriately of the times are changing mm -hmm. so fast. 
And this is one thing we have learned about, um, you know, computing power, for example, Moore's law, we are accelerating the rate of change and how, how fast, I mean, how real is this? How fast is this going? You've looked, you've done a ton of research through all these different vectors of Mm -hmm. study, like, and will it keep getting faster? Because right now I know so many people who are overwhelmed and are right. scared and are, I mean, what is AI's impact going to sure. have on my job? I am a fill in the blank. We don't need to go mm-hmm. into the AI. We've done a lot of right. episodes on that. Right, and right. I want people to buy the book because your, your <laughs> thoughts on it are really powerful. But like, where are we on this arc? I think you can, you can go down a lot of rabbit holes and end up, you know, I used the word anxiety earlier. You can, you can get really anxious. Um, you know, by thinking about those scenarios, it's not that there isn't anything to them. I guess I just, I try to focus on individuals, you know, I don't, I don't know what the future will hold, you know, for governments and industrial systems and, you know, the future with a capital F, like I I have no idea about that. Uh, what I know is that, you know, individuals can equip themselves with skills and resources that will allow them to thrive in different circumstances. and. You know, interestingly enough, by doing that, you're probably going to be less anxious, uh, you know, and less overwhelmed because you are equipped and resourced. Um, and so, I, I mean, in addition to all of the study that I did for the book, you know, over the past couple of years, you know, I also did a lot of work on myself and tried to figure out how can I be less anxious and less sad. And, you know, probably the biggest lesson is I, I don't worry about things that I can't control. And if you really limit yourself and say, what is the small, you know, this really small circle of, of things that are within my influence, how can I devote my attention and focus to that? And it's really exciting because you can actually have some real impact um, and far less anxiety um, than by worrying about stuff that, that you have no idea about and probably can't do much about. Mm. You just keep talking about skills. And I think it's fascinating. You went into some really detailed skills. I wonder if there are some meta skills that you mm. feel like are important for people to over index on meta skills. You have an example of that perhaps? Yeah. Like knowing how I, I would, you know, if, if I was asked the question, I just asked you, I would think that an answer would be, and this is biased because of mm. companies that I've built and where uh-huh. I've placed my attention, but learning how you learn such mm. that like okay. acqui- acquiring skills, if you, think based on your education from high school or college that there's going to be some textbooks published and you need to go get those textbooks from a thing called a library and sit Mm -hmm. down and read them. And if you think that that's how learning happens and it it might be true for you that learning doesn't sound all that exciting, but if you were, if you realized that learning happens, like there's a thousand ways that watching a YouTube video while you're listening to a podcast and pausing one to listen to mm-hmm. some other and then going down mm-hmm. the rabbit hole and yep. specifically about you, because knowing that we all learn differently based on our mm. upbringing and the, you know, whether we're visual learners or auditory learners or right, so right. I, I okay. like, I like the, the meta skill of learning and specifically mm. learning how you learn such mm. that when you're faced with how to like SEO your website in right. order to get web traffic, <laughs> that you don't do the shittiest thing that <laughs> some, you know, take a bad, class from Sacramento Community College on right. how to do SEO. <laughs> right. Because like, that's what you thought learning was. So right, I would use right. that as an example. Okay. And that's maybe. a that's a great example. Actually, I love that. Uh, I will add maybe something about self-insight uh, because I think a lot of people don't really know what they want, mm. uh, whether it is in life in general or even just on a you know weekly basis or in my job right now or what I'm working towards in my relationships, you know, in my wellness and health. And so a really, really simple thing you can do um, is I like to ask myself this question. It's, it's two questions. Uh, First one is how am I feeling? And I just like have a little journal and I'm just like, how am I feeling? Just write down a few words, you know, could be emotions or could be like a sentence or two or something. How am I feeling? And the second question is what do I want? You know, and I kind of connect it, connect to those two, because if you just start with, what do I want? You know, it feels a little bit overwhelming and broad, but if you're like, how am I feeling? Then what do you want is often connected to those feelings. You know, I'm feeling a little bit disconnected. I'm feeling stressed. Well, how are you feeling stressed? Like, how can we get more specific about that? And then you're like, okay, maybe, maybe to 
alleviate some of this stress or to make me feel more connected or more purposeful or whatever I'm trying to do, here's a specific action I can take right now. It could be a really, it could be a big action. It could be like, I need to quit my job right now. Most of the time it's more just like, I need to go for a walk and you go for that walk and you just think, you know, for a little bit and don't listen to music or podcasts or anything. And you just kind of like, you go back 10 minutes later and you're, you know, better in some way. And you've also gained that insight. So I always encourage people just when in doubt, you know, ask yourself, like, how am I feeling right now? And what do I want? And then see what you can do with that information. That, you know, this, what is it, Socrates, know thyself turns out right. to be a pretty, pretty powerful mm -hmm. thing that so many of us, have, as you wisely point out, are ill-equipped to answer those questions. Mm -hmm. um, and you're the second person uh, on this show to posit that continuously asking yourself, what do I want? is an amazing lever for mm. getting very clear. Mm. Uh, speaking of clear, James Clear is, oh, the, uh, is the other yeah, person great. who, who the author of Atomic Habits, uh, mm. I had him on the show and we just brought him back for a reunion um, episode as a part of a thing we're doing summer school here in 2023, mm. some of my favorite episodes. This idea of asking yourself, what do you want over and over and over? It's ama it's amazing when you start mm -hmm. to do that you're scratching at things and then there's these little you know it's, yeah. it's like it's like an it's like an onion so it doesn't it's a new it's me. a new process for some people yeah. you know like if you haven't done it before it's kind of interesting you you might realize something's been bugging you for a long time uh, but you just haven't identified it or maybe like you knew it was there but to just like actually like speak it or write it um, just to say okay I'm actually going to acknowledge this thing that I already know but you know I I've been kind of putting it um, you know, on the back burner by design, and I'm going to actually force myself to confront this, which sounds really kind of intimidating. I probably shouldn't have used that phrase. Uh, but the point is just by acknowledging it, you're going to be better off uh, in the long run. Okay. I was asking originally about sort of meta skills I mm -hmm. offered up as an example, you know, learning. So learning how to learn, for example, right. such yeah. that you can apply that to other skills, learning how you learn best and trusting that with your intuition and experience. You then offered up this you know, the multi-thousand-year-old know thyself, which is sure. freaking brilliant. We've all forgot that because we'd all, mm -hmm. if, if I ask people, well, great, I want to, you know, coach you on how to achieve your goal. What's your goal? Right. There's just paralysis. It's right. almost like yep. they don't know what you want. And it's very mm -hmm. hard to get what you want if you, if you don't know what you want. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult yeah. to get it. Right, right, right. Um, so I'm going to signal that this is perhaps a third thing, but the, mm. the cues that I'm taking are from you because you've talked about mental health early mm. on. You talked about um, anxiety, reducing mm. anxiety and you know taking care of yourself. And even to the point of, if you go back to the, your, your Croatia story, there was something that wasn't settled. Mm -hmm. You looked inside, you decided to do something about it, and you left that place and you went somewhere where you felt, you know, fill in the blank. You said you did some running and you did some yeah. reflecting and and it was and you ate some strudel, which was mm -hmm. very important. Yep. And and it occurs to me that that is another one of these skills, learning how to take care of yourself. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering what are is there anything besides this sort of journaling that mm. that underpins you know, your belief in this new era that we're upon in gonzo capitalism mm -hmm. that clearly taking care of yourself matters. I know that you, because I follow you very closely, that you have tracked, you've done some insane, I don't know what the number is now, but <laughs> oh. number of like moving your body days. And I don't know if those are all running or whatever, yeah. but maybe you can tell us a couple of stories, A, about your adventures, your physical mm -hmm like way of taking care of yourself and any other details you want to put around that such that we might be able to learn how to better take care of ourselves. Yeah, no, I love that. Um, yeah, my, my Apple watch running streak, uh, it's, it's 1600 days now, I think 1600. Um, so I am, I am proud of that, but I guess you could also argue that that's compulsive. Like it's okay to take a day off. Right. I understand that argument. Um, for me, I, I didn't intend for it to be like a thousand plus I, I wanted it to be a hundred and I got to a hundred and then I was like, Oh, maybe a year. You know, and then I got to that and just kind of kept going, which is a lot, a lot of uh, very similar to like going to every country in the world. Uh, you know, when, when you and I first connected like 10, 15 years ago, I was, you know, trying to visit every country in the world. 
And it also came about by, I was like, oh, I've been to like 50 countries. Let me just like list them out. Okay, how many countries are there in the world? 193, 192 at the time. Um, let me go to 100. And then it just kept going. So I think like the whole thing about how confidence or experience produces confidence, you know, is, is important. But in terms of, of self-care, I, I, I'm, I'm not an expert on that. I just know myself like trying to maybe have some focus and not try to do everything, um, <clears throat> you know, not try to be on every social media platform, which I don't do very well anyway. And I, I have, like, I want to improve, but I also kind of accept, you know, okay, there's some things I'm good at. I'm going to just kind of, kind of do that. Um, you know, I have, I have these five goals and every day I kind of, maybe not every day, but like a few days a week, I'm like, just kind of reviewing those goals. And, you know, one of them is be true to myself. And in some ways you're like, well, that's kind of, you know, a nebulous goal or kind of vague. But I think most people, if they ask themselves, like at any point in time, like, am I being true to myself? Kind of have an answer to it. You're like, yeah, I, I am being true to myself or there's something that's not really aligned, you know, and what can I do to change that? So I'm always like, am I being true to myself? Another one is to cultivate harmonious relationships. And so I'm like, am I, am I checking on people that I care for? You know, am I, am I spending time with friends and loved ones and really making that a priority uh, as much as any business goal, you know, or any other goal um, and actually having that be the, be the priority. So I organize my life around a routine and like a lot of habits, just like I know you do as well. Try to like mix it up and have adventures also, but uh, I guess it's something to do with that mix of, of like regular habits that I'm doing every day uh, versus okay, every once in a while, I want to do something really fun and go far away or do something different otherwise. Very, very, very grateful for, I, I think this may be your best work ever. It's certainly got an edge mm. to it that is incredibly well-timed. Mm. If anyone out there is interested in an actual field guide, this is like mm. practical to the core, which is so what I know of you. You're like, mm. you won't even answer a question about, I don't know what everybody else does, but I know <laughs> that there's a gamer who racks right. up digital currency by breeding virtual crabs. Right, right. Like, and here's, here's the story of that person. Um, mm. But thank you for creating mm. this book. Again, Gonzo Capitalism, How to Make Money in an Economy That Hates You. This is a field guide to turning your time, your talent, your creativity, into income on your own terms. Uh, thank you so much for being a guest on the show. Aside, we're really good. Our community is really good at buying books, and this is awesome. absolutely a laser beam at the heart of our community. So, um, I've pre-ordered mine, and I know that will a lot of other folks will be as well. Where else could you steer us? Is, is there anything else? Um, the newsletter that you put out, uh, sure. where, where the podcast? Like, what's what do you feel like are so maybe if you want to stack rank a couple of other ways that people can participate in of course. your world, knowing how good this stuff is. Oh, I, I appreciate that. I'm happy to connect uh, uh, with anyone. And I don't sell anything for the most part, just books. Like everything I do is, is free. So weekly newsletter, chrisgillibow.com. Uh, daily, hopefully you're going to link that up because nobody can spell it, but you'll link it up. <laughs> uh, sidehustleschool.com. That's the daily podcast. Been doing that uh, for uh, well over 2,000 days at this point. Wow. Um, it's available wherever podcasts, you know, are streamed side hustle school, uh, and then on Instagram at one ninety three countries. Amazing. Thanks. Don't forget to pre-order your book folks. Uh, again, anywhere books are sold gonzo capitalism, Chris, thank you so much for being a guest on the show yet again. Thank you. You're, so much. you're a, a regular here. You're always welcome your ideas and innovations and the thoughtful way that you approach the world is an inspiration mm -hmm. to me deeply personally. And um, thank you again for being a guest. Thank you so much, Chase. Until next time, from Chris G. and myself, we both bid you an amazing rest of your day. <laughs>